right, so today we start a new series um, called Kingdom in Focus. In Jesus' teachings, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, but all through the Gospels, um, Jesus does a lot of teaching about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. In fact, I don't know if you've caught this in reading the Gospels, but that is actually Jesus' primary message was the message about the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew 4, 17 says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, quote, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. That was his message. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then a few verses later in verse 23 of the same chapter, Matthew 4. It says, Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And healing every disease and sickness among the people. His message was the message of the good news of the kingdom. And particularly in, in the Gospel of Matthew, there in, in Matthew chapter 13, and then again in Matthew chapter 25, there are a number of parables, a number of stories that Jesus tells that where he begins his story by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like, and he tells a story. And he helps us grasp the reality of the kingdom of heaven by painting pictures for us with words. And over the next few weeks, we're going to spend some time in some of these parables, um, some of these stories, immersing ourselves in the values of the kingdom of heaven so that hopefully we will grow a little bit to understand what it means to live in the kingdom of heaven. So the first, the, Matthew 13 starts with the story we've often called the, the sower and the seed. The story of the sower and the seed. And we're actually going gonna to take Luke's version of this story. Um, this parable for most of it. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 8. If you've got your Bibles or Bible apps, join me in Luke chapter 8. We're going to read through our passage this morning and then dive in. Luke 8, starting in verse 4. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on the rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he has ears to hear. Let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. 
And then the devil comes and he takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. So may God open our hearts to his word this morning. So Jesus tells this story of um, of a farmer spreading seed. And, and um, if you've ever seen, you know, pictures or video of, of what this looked like in those days, I mean, they didn't have, they didn't have planting machines, right? They would, they would plow up the field, plow up the ground, and then they would take a bag of seed and they would literally cast the seed, throw the seed on the, on the field, right? They would walk up and down the rows throwing, throwing the seed. And so that's the picture that everybody hearing this story has in their mind because that's what they've done all their lives is throw the seed. And Jesus is saying, imagine this farmer throwing the seed and some of it falls on different kinds of soil. And depending on where the seed fell, would, would uh, you know, it, there would be different responses to, to the seed. This, there's nothing, the seed is good, right? The seed is good. But where it falls is, is what matters. The environment that's given the seed is what matters. Jesus tells us that in this story, the seed is the Word of God, the Gospel, right? In fact, in Matthew's version of this same story, in Matthew's version, Matthew sa says that he calls it, uh, he says that Jesus says that the seed is the message about the kingdom. Isn't that interesting? The message about the kingdom. That's the gospel. The message about the kingdom. Message about God, what, what happens when God is king. So the seed is the word of God. And the first place that Jesus describes the seed falling is on a path. Right? And today we'll call that the hard heart. Did, yeah, the papers got distributed. Good, good, good. That's just a tool for you to, if you want to take notes. No pressure, but uh, there you go. Um, so we're going to call that the hard heart. And, uh, and Jesus describes, he says, what happens when the seed falls on the, on the path, on the person who's got this, this hard heart, the enemy comes and steals away the word before they can believe it. They've heard it, but not really heard it. And it's stolen away before they can believe it. Today we're going to call that satanic supernatural robbery. Right? The enemy knows how powerful, how freeing, how life-giving the Word of God is. And his best bet in our lives is to steal away the Word before we can grab onto it. 
And so that's one of the, the enemy's most common tricks is to try to steal away the word from a person's heart before they can grab onto it and believe it. Um, again, Matthew's version of this story says it this way. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. This is the seed along the path. What is it that's unique about soil on a path? What, what is it that's unique about a path? Right? Well, people walk over it again and again. Right? And over time, what maybe used to be good soil has been beaten down and pressed down and trampled down so that now it is hard. For some people who have had their lives trampled on again and again and their hearts have grown cynical in self-protection and self-defense and they, their hearts have become hard. And God desires more than anything for that ground to be broken up and for the seed to take root there. But the, but the enemy has, has had his way in, in beating down their, their hearts, beating down their lives, making their heart, hearts hard and trampled so that there's not an openness to the gospel. The enemy also, I mean, that's one way that he hardens our hearts, that he snatches away the seed from our hearts. But he also sends distractions, right? How often do we, you know, go to spend time with Jesus and something, something more urgent comes up to take away our attention and take away our focus? And the enemy is, a, is great at at throwing distractions at us, right? To steal away, to snatch away the word from our hearts. Even in a, in a, in a, you know, a space and a time like this on a Sunday morning, um, he, he would rather have you thinking about the, the shed that needs to be cleaned out or the, the, the dinner you need to cook or whatever it is that's, that's pulling at your attention rather than grabbing a hold of the truth that, he wants, that God wants you to grab a hold of today, right? The enemy loves to steal away the word before it can settle into our hearts. So trampling and, and hardening of our hearts Stealing away by distractions. And the third way I think that, that, uh, that su satanic supernatural robbery happens in our lives is the lies that the enemy throws at us about, about who God is. Right? To get us to not believe that God is good. To not believe what God says about us, about Him, about the people around us. He uses lies to steal away the truth. So the first seed fell on the path. The second seed fell on shallow hearts. Shallow ground with stones, stony hearts. Right? Right? Say with me today, no root, no fruit. No root, no fruit. Uh, a plant gets its nutrients, water, nitrates, it gets its nutrients through its root structure. And if it doesn't put down good roots, there's no hope of a plant getting, becoming mature. There's no hope at all of, of fruit coming from the plant. Um, and so, 
in, as, as Jesus was describing this heart, he said they, they accept the, the word with joy when they hear it, but they don't put down roots. Right? They accept the word with joy when they hear it, but they don't put down roots. It's not about how someone starts their journey of faith that counts, but how they finish. Right? It's not just about how we start, but it's more about how we finish. We need to not just be glad someone made a decision for Jesus, but we need to help them figure out what is next. Right? If you, I want to encourage you today, if you lead someone to Jesus, if you have the amazing privilege of sharing the gospel with a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, someone, and you have the privilege of leading them to Jesus, then it's also your responsibility to help them know what's next, to disciple them. And that sounds scary. It's this big thing to disciple someone. But discipling someone is helping them put down roots. Just helping them put down roots. Helping them put the dis- disciplines and the knowledge of the Word and the structure in their lives that will help sustain them on their faith journey for the long haul. Right? Right? Some of you had somebody do that for you, and some of you didn't. Some of you had to figure it out on your own, and it was, it was hard to do that, right? It was difficult figuring out, how do, I, how, do I, how do I do this? How do I live this journey? And so we want to make sure that it's as easy as possible for someone to put down roots, it just doesn't happen by accident. Jesus didn't tell us, now go and get decisions. But he said, go and make disciples. Right? And there's a difference, isn't there? It's when, when someone comes to Jesus, our job with them is just beginning. To help them put down roots. Often people... As Jesus described, accept the gospel with joy, but it doesn't stick. They don't follow through. And oftentimes we're disappointed when that happens, right? Where'd they go? You know, what happened? But we need to ask ourselves, did we do everything that we could to help them get started well? Did we help them put down roots? Here's another question. Do we have good roots ourselves? I was talking with someone this week who is struggling deeply with an addiction. And they were saying how they should have known better. They've been a Christian for decades, but they did not have a consistent devotion time with the Lord. They were lazy about church attendance. And they'd made pursuing a a good career and a nice home their priority. And they didn't have a well-rooted life. People might look up to us and see us as solid Christians, but if we're honest with ourselves, do we have a root system that will get us through the storms? Because there is an oncoming storm, folks. It may not be long before it's very difficult in this nation and in this world to be a follower of Jesus. It may not be long before certain aspects of our faith are not just frowned upon, but outlawed. Right? Right? It may not be long before we face real persecution. 
not just funny looks, but real persecution. Do we have a root system that will sustain us no matter what comes? I remember um, when we were, I was probably 12 years old. We lived in a rented farmhouse on a big, big farm operation. Um, and our neighbors lived next door to us. They were the farmers. They owned the property and they probably had, I don't know, 1,200 acres of, of fields. And, and uh, remember one day, one early summer or spring morning being um, so, so bored as a 12-year-old kid that I actually went across the, the road into the field with the family, father, mother, and about six kids, out in the field picking stones out of the field. Right? They had a big wagon. They were picking up stones out of the field. The field had been plowed, but now there's stones everywhere that had been stirred up, and we were all picking up stones and throwing them on the wagon. Right? Why? Because, because if the stones were left there, the, the, the seeds could not take root. Right? You can't, you can't plant corn or, or wheat or whatever it is you're planting. You can't plant it in stony ground. And so they knew that. And so they were picking up the stones and throwing them on the wagon and we cleared a giant field that day of, of stones, right? So I think in this story that the stones, what are the stones? Jesus doesn't tell us what the stones are. But they were there before the, before the seed was sown. I think they're the, the belief systems that were already there in that person's heart, the allegiances and values that were already there before the gospel came. And those stones, those, those things that they were committed to, those things that they believed before the gospel came needed to be removed bit by bit so that the, so that the seed could take root and the seed could go down in their lives. You know, you can't, we can't just add Jesus to everything else in our life. But he actually needs to become our king. He actually needs to become everything to us. And all those other stones need to be picked up and cast aside so that Jesus and his kingdom truth can can take root in our hearts. The third kind of soil was, was a cluttered, calling it a cluttered heart. Thorny soil. Our garden, we have a garden, I don't know if you knew that, um, kind of a community garden where we we. You know, for the last few years, we've tried to grow some produce. And whatever we grow gets taken to the, the food bank, the volunteer center here in town. Our garden here this year produced very little of anything. Um, think a few tomatoes. It started out well. It was planted well. It was... It was it started out well, but it wasn't cared for, and the weeds grew up, and the weeds took over, and the weeds choked the plants, so we had almost nothing to give to the volunteer center this year. There was nothing wrong with the seeds. Seeds were good seeds, but the environment was not conducive to the seeds thriving, right? The powerful message of the gospel, powerful, life-transforming, 
life-changing message of the gospel and its ability to, to, to truly transform our lives is emptied of its unique power when it is just one of many values and priorities that we're trying to juggle. When it's just one of many messages, one of many things that we're trying to fill our lives with. I want to get something from Jesus. If I can fit him in between pursuing success in my career and watching my investments and keeping up with my social calendar and staying on top of my social media and taking care of this and doing that. And, you know, Jesus says, life's worries, riches, and pleasures choke out the spiritual life that is trying to grow in our hearts. Life's worries, riches, and pleasures. Worries. You've heard it said, I'm sure, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. He'll get you chasing your tail so much, trying to fix things and hold your life together that you don't believe you have time to spend with Jesus. You don't have time to get to church. You don't have time to pour into your kids' lives spiritually and disciple them. But that's all a big lie of the enemy, isn't it? Because if we prioritize those things that really matter, our time with Jesus, worshiping with our brothers and sisters, pouring into our kids' lives, and discipling them, and we'll find that the things that are less important that used to consume our thoughts and our energy begin to find their proper place in our hearts when we put Jesus first, when we make Him King in our hearts. Worries, riches, Comfort and security are two of the biggest gods of our culture in North America, aren't they? How much is enough? Just a little more. Right? And the pursuit of enough will choke out spiritual life in our hearts. And pleasures. I don't know that Jesus was necessarily even talking about, you know, um, sinful pleasures, although that's a that's an issue, big issue in our hearts as well. But but just pursuing the good life, right? There's nothing wrong with enjoying life. There's probably nothing wrong with. Most of the things that we care about or we enjoy doing, but, but they have to have their proper place in our hearts and in our lives. We are in God's kingdom, folks. We are citizens of God's kingdom, and that means Jesus is king. And Him being king must order the rest of our priorities and the rest of the things that we, that, that we care about in our lives, right? We don't fit Jesus in as an afterthought, but everything else comes after him. He defines everything else for us. And then Jesus says, the last seed fell on good soil. Noble and good heart. That word noble isn't one that we maybe use a lot these days, but I think a noble heart is a heart 
that is focused on high things, on valuable things, on important things. A noble heart is a heart that values the kingdom, that we act like nobility in the kingdom. We value God and His kingdom. A noble and good heart is a heart that is surrendered, a heart that has made it a point to have no agenda other than what God wants for my life. A noble and good heart. And Jesus says, this person hears those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Say this with me. Hear, retain, persevere, produce. Let's say it one more time. Hear, retain, persevere, and produce. That's the heart that that produces, Jesus says, 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. They hear, they retain, they persevere, and produce. Do you hear me? There is an appointment that I have this this afternoon that Pam asked me yesterday if I was remembering it. And my reply was, I don't remember ever being told about this. Now, (laughs) do you think it was because I was never told? Or maybe the words hit my eardrum, but I didn't hear. Right? Is that possible? I don't know. Maybe possible. Maybe. (laughs) A heart that is good soil, Jesus says, hears what God is saying to them. There's a difference between hearing and hearing. Right? But a good heart hears what God is saying to them. Jesus says in this very parable, he or she who has ears to hear, let them hear. Here, right? It's possible many times for what God is trying to get through to us, what He's trying to say to us, we hear it, but we don't hear it. We hear it, but that's great for someone else, right? We're good at shoveling it over to the person behind us. But the good soil is a person that hears what God is saying to them. And then retains it. Holds on to it. How often do we hear what, do we hear God saying to us, maybe maybe some point He's getting through to us in a a sermon, it, 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 it touches our hearts, it touches our lives. And then before we get to the parking lot, it's gone. Right? We hear it, but we don't retain it. We don't hold on to it. We don't live in the light of that thing that God spoke into our hearts. So how do we retain it? Well, one way is that's why, why we've got this tool of the, the note pages. If you like them, great. If you don't, that's fine. Toss them aside. But, but find a way to retain what God is saying to you, Right? Take notes. Journal. In your time with Jesus, if He says something to you, write about it so it doesn't get lost in the the stuff of life. Write in your Bibles. It's okay to do that. Right? Write in your Bibles. If God highlights a verse to you, underline it. Write beside it. Like, Make note of it. Cherish that moment. God spoke to me. He said something to me that touched me. I want to hold on to this, right? Retain it. 
talk about it with others, or even teach someone who's new on their journey. One of the best ways to retain is to teach something. Uh, when we teach something, our, our retention as the teacher goes from like, you know, 25 to 75%. When we teach something, so pour, pour it out to someone else. Here, retain, persevere. Persevere. Keep going. Keep trusting. Keep walking out what God has said to you. Keep walking out His promises. Even when you don't see the fruit of them yet, you don't see them manifest in your life yet, keep walking it out. The answer, um, the answer is to, to just keep, keep leaning into what God is saying to you. In every season, in every situation, in every storm, just keep going. Galatians 6.10 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Persevere. Hold on to God's word to you. And then produce. We do not want to live unproductive lives for Jesus. Right? We want fruit in our lives. Both fruit in us, the fruit of the Spirit in our character, in our hearts, in our lives. We want fruit in in us, but we also want fruit to trail behind us. As we walk through this journey that we would actually have fruit coming out of our lives that would be, be an effect on the people around us. How do we live fruitful lives? We keep a noble and good heart towards the Lord. We hear, retain, persevere, and produce. Grab hold of His Word. We let it sink deep in our hearts. We keep holding on to it and keep moving forward even when it gets difficult. And we, we, we make it our goal to be a person that is fruitful for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. I want to lead you in a, a song. It's an oldie from, well, oldish e. We have different, different definitions of oldie. This is uh, from back in the 90s, but it's, uh, it's an oldie. Pure heart, that's what. i yeah.
Father, I thank you for your love for us, God. Thank you for your amazing, life-changing word, the gospel. God, I pray that our hearts would be hearts that are noble and good. That we would receive your word and let it change our hearts, our lives would become fruitful citizens of your kingdom. Lives ordered by our king. Led by our king. Come have your way in our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pastor, as you were sharing that word today, talking about retaining last Sunday you preached was just a small portion about murmuring and complaining and I want you to know church and many of you have been in the faith for a long time you know this already God will put us to the test last Monday not man Monday Tuesday I was the only one in the kiosk and it just happened to be a day where people were coming back, you know, from Thanksgiving. It seems like no one has food. You know, everybody comes back to Walmart. And there was pension. There was three factors. And it, I was just overwhelmed. And everybody around me was complaining. But I was saying, oh, yeah, I remember you, Pastor, what you preached about not murmuring and complaining trying to be a light. If I were to fail that, the Lord probably would have placed that same message on the pastor's heart again. And I would have been tested again. How patient God is with us. Amen? Amen. It's your desire to follow through, is it not? You want to get close to the Lord. And you're going to be tested. We're just going to open the altar today. And I'm just wondering if we could come and linger at the front of the church. And just ask God, help me to pass the test. Help me to retain what you speak to me. And to follow through with it.
we're going to do that. We're going to open the altar. And we're just going to invite you to come. Can we linger today? Maybe today you need healing. Maybe today you need a special touch from the Lord. Whatever you need, something good is going to happen. Because God is faithful. We're just going to invite the breakthrough team to come to come and minister. But we're just going to open things up. And may God help us next week to pass the test. Amen. Can we come today just to wait upon the Lord? Can we do that? Let's move out from where we are. If we have to go at this time, God bless you. We ask you that you would uh, just uh, fellowship in the, the foyer. But can we come today and just wait upon the Lord? to pour his strength into us and help us to pass the test and give him our undivided attention. And maybe there's something in your heart that's more important than God at this time. We need to ask God to help us with that as well. Let's come, shall we? Let's wait upon him. And God bless you and have a good